good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, Grand Rounds today. Uh, today, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Denise Sorrentino. Uh, Dr. Sorrentino is a cardiologist and electrophysiologist. Uh, she did her training in cardiology and electrophysiology at Emory and subsequently uh, has been a member of uh, the Iowa Heart Center and on the medical staff here at MGMC. And uh, I've had the opportunity to practice with Dr. Sorrentino and co-manage patients, uh, innumerable patients over the last several years. And I can personally attest to the fact that she is a superb <coughs> clinician, cardiologist and electrophysiologist. But I think maybe what is perhaps more germane to today's educational offering is that she also is an outstanding communicator uh, and educator. And I think... Uh, that's borne out by the fact that her uh, last Grand Rounds presentation that we have archived on our YouTube channel, uh, as of earlier this week, has garnered 95,320 views. Uh, and so uh, the CME committee was very appreciative of the fact that she was able to accept our invitation today to provide us uh, with an update on the uh, role of wearables and future technologies in cardiovascular medicine. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Denise Sorrentino. Thanks, Denise. Well, thank you, and may I say thank you to the committee for inviting me. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, one of the things I love to do is um, give educational information to people who are interested. And so, um, although this room isn't very crowded, I am hopeful that there are a lot online collecting CMEs for this event. So, you know, um, when I was asked to do this talk, at first I was a little surprised. I may say that I've been asked to give a talk on a lot of different things, but never on wearable technologies and new technologies. And I'll just have to say this. It's certainly one of my personal passions and one of my big jams. And I just came back two weeks ago from the second annual Artificial Intelligence and Cardiovascular Medicine put on by Mayo Clinic in Palm Springs, where actually I went with my young of my three sons, uh, who is a math PhD uh, candidate, and we were in Palm Springs for four days getting all updated on artificial intelligence and medicine. So this is definitely my area. Um, I have been at Mary Greeley Medical Center coming up to 28 years. So uh, Dr. Hallberg and I, when they first brought me here to um, interview me for this position with Iowa Heart, at that time we actually were stationed in McFarland Clinic on the second floor. I'm going back 28 years. My office, I sat right next to Rick Carino and Nate Ratnasamy to bring some of you back. Um, when they brought me to dinner the day that I came to visit, uh, Dr. Hallberg joined. He had some time in Atlanta, so my partners thought that maybe Steve Hallberg would be a good person to encourage me to come, and it worked. And then I'll say this. This is the truth for anyone who knows Dr. Hallberg. Every time I see him in the hall, and see this person approaching, he looks like the same person I met 28 years ago. So very few people are that ageless, but I will say Dr. Steve Hallberg, like, looks the same. He hasn't changed. So he gives me hope and all of the uh, futures of medicine and taking great care of oneself because Dr. Hallberg lives that for sure. Um, so just had to lend that compliment out. We're going to start out with some questions because, again, I think uh, giving a presentation at lunchtime is tough. Either people are busy eating or um, postprandial, ready to sleep or take a nap. So um, we're going to switch over, give you a QR code because I have a few. These are not difficult questions, but a few questions to ask all of you. So uh, Tim is going to switch over to our... QR code if you want to scan that with your phone. I believe the online people can either scan it if they can see it or put in 7246-8754. We'll give you just a moment. But the first question is, are you wearing a wearable health device today? How many people in this room or at home at their office watching this talk are wearing one? Oh, good. I see the yeses rising. We'll give it a few more. And you know, one of the responses is, I don't even know what you're talking about, but we will talk about it. But um, are you wearing one? So, okay, the yeses are winning. Uh, we could go to the next. So uh, more people are wearing than not. 
And at the end of this talk, hopefully you will all consider either having a wearable or wearing one. Anybody in the room or at their office or at home wearing two or more? And oh yeah, it's very easy to wear two or more. No effort needed. Only a few people. All right. We'll move on to the next one. Does your specialty area utilize RPM in patient follow-up? And we'll talk about RPM, but if you don't know what RPM is, then I guess you don't use it. Oh, no, the no's are winning. I think after we talk about it thoroughly, you'll understand what it is, and you might say, okay, yeah, I think our office uses that, or maybe we do do that, but... Only three on the yes, and you know, um, this is a really important area today for all areas, whether you're hospital-based, hospital, hospitalist versus clinic-based. Um, RPM, which is remote patient monitoring, is key for the success of your practice. So we're going to move you all to yeses today. Do any of you use an AI platform in clinical practice or patient communication? So this is, I'm talking about clinical, um, not like... Um, you're doing it for a question of your own, but use it daily, whether you're using it to um, format a patient plan of care, whether you're using it in a communication uh, network, are you using any? I call it augmented intelligence. A lot of people call it artificial intelligence, but we're talking about the same thing. So a few people, uh, yes, good. And again, I'm going to talk to you about ways that possibly this is going to work for everybody in a very positive way. We'll go on to the next one. Do any of you use AI in your daily life outside of work? And let's just be clear. The biggest online source, chat GPT, per week has 100 million users worldwide. 100 million. So if you don't use it, I encourage you to give it a try. You don't have to use it to uh, make a final decision in your life, but um, 100 million users per week, not per year, per week. All right. Sorry, we're going to um, go to the talk. Okay, so what are wearables? Well, there are hundreds of wearable devices out there. I have uh, photos here of four, but uh, we could have, you know, the whole textbook on wearable medical devices. The one on the, f uh, in the beginning, that's an Apple Watch. We know that the Apple Watches have been available for multiple generations now, helping stream activity, heart rate. Apple Watch 4 and above will give you EKG. Uh, detect movement, falls, and could be used for your communication, text alert, email alerts. But as far as wearable for healthcare, the Apple Watch, and please, I'm not just supporting Apple. Samsung has their generation of watches. They do the same things, pretty similar. And so many people in this room, when they answered yes, it's likely that they have a watch. Next to it is something that I'm a huge proponent of, and that's a, a Cardia. Alive Core began making cardio mobile devices in the mid 2000 teens. When I go to the AI conferences, the originator, who is a cardiologist, attends and gives presentations. I've met him, I've gotten to know him. So, this is innovation where it is two fingers on either side of a small metal piece, which is about the size of a stick of gum, a little bit thicker, but very small, can fit in anybody's pocket, purse, or wallet. And it can give you, I will really just say, an excellent quality EKG. That technology I'll talk about a little bit more. It's advanced to a six-lead EKG, soon to be a 12-lead EKG with three touch points. Right next to it is um, uh, something I don't own, but it's on my list. Um, and I don't know if any of the yeses with two devices. If you're wearing two today, it's likely that you have the Aura Ring as your number two. You might have a continuous glucose monitor, but uh, next to that is Aura Ring. We'll talk about that a little bit longer. The Aura Ring was invented in approximately 2015 in Finland, 
And this has a huge worldwide uptake. It's a little bit of a fashion statement as well, much more costly than the first two, but this aura ring will give you probably more accurate sleep information and improve your sleep health more than your watch or anything else that is on the market. So the aura ring detects uh, heart rate variability. It detects um, sleep, activity, and they use that score to give you a morning readiness score. Readiness is a score if you are ready for the day. And it actually ends up being very accurate. It alerts people to possible infection or sepsis, elevated heart rate, low heart rate variability. And one of my partners who wears the Aura Ring every day feels that it's much easier to sleep with than wearing a watch. And he's decided to completely eliminate alcohol consumption because every night after a few glasses of wine, his heart rate variability dives down and his readiness score that next morning is quite low. And finally, at the very end, that's kind of a squash picture that I pulled, but it's a wearable blood pressure cuff. So um, if you could look at the wearable blood pressure cuffs, just recently online, they've gone on deep sale. And that's because some of the current watches that Samsung and Apple are making are using sensors to, and they're doing the studies now to accurately, without that little watch there at the very end, it inflates and deflates around your wrist. To get your blood pressure, you have to hold it up to heart level. It will inflate, deflate, and give you a very accurate blood pressure reading. It's gone on deep sale because now they're soon the technology will be improved for the watches without an inflation, but with the use of sensors to give an accurate blood pressure reading. But again, we love this. Um, we realize that the more readings we have, the more information we have to help treat and manage patients. Remember having wearables has two very important customers. Of course, the people in marketing for AliveCore and Apple and Samsung and Aura, especially that ring, um, focus a lot on the people who are making the purchase, but they also have to um, have the customer of the people receiving the data, which is all of you in this room. Not only do wearable devices help patients manage their personal health care, they help us manage their health care, but only if there's buy-in. And again, when I get asked to speak about wearables, I realize that likely a lot of physicians, both in internal medicine, family practice, and the subspecialties are feeling like uh, the wearables are a nuisance, i.e. patients come to the ED, and I don't see the ED docs in here, but they do come to the ED saying, I came here because my Apple Watch said I'm having AFib. And so we see a lot of that. Um, again, it depends on your uh, perspective. I think it's fabulous. AFib is prevalence currently in the United States of 6 million people. And so we know the earlier we pick up AFib, the better the outcomes for the patient, the more likely we can help prevent stroke by adequately anticoagulating people. So I think the wearable data is important. One of my former nurses is sitting up at the very top, Amanda, and she'll tell you the issue is receiving all this data. So I have a large practice of arrhythmia patients. I strongly encourage them to have either a watch or a cardia. And she'll tell you the hassle is them sending all the information in. Sometimes it's like holding back the dam of water where people are sending and sending. And sometimes it's sending a lot of normals. And we have to get that information. The staff, the nurses have to look at it get it scanned in the chart, send it to me, then I need to look at it. And the volume increase for docs and nurses who already have full inboxes makes that really a challenge. I'll talk about that later where um, AI likely can help us sort through a lot of that data. Certainly for these devices to be utilized, validation studies are needed. We just don't want something to come to market and that we're going to use it to help make a decision for the patient and have it all be part of me garbage. So validation studies have been done. Um, it's, it's more than just marketing or a press release. If you're, you're going to get this into physicians' offices and have a physician recommend having, um, I usually recommend the uh, Cardia Currently, I just recommended one yesterday, and the patient's son looked it up on Amazon. He was able to get it for $74. It used to be $99. But if you get an entry-level um, small Alive Core Cardia, it's under $80, and then you have it for life. Um, so we need more than just press release. We need these validated. Uh, the use of wearables is on the rise. 
Um, the black box is of millions and the uh, red dot is percentage of the population. So, you know, we've got a quarter of the population out there wearing these. As medical providers, we have to be ready for this. We have to be ready to look at the output of these devices and make a determinant, are we going to use it, yes or no. It's kind of like when, um, I, I call it Dr. Google, when Dr. Google began, which means when... Um, People were able to Google a diagnosis and get a decent amount of information. I think I could tell you back when this all began, which was, you know, a good 15 years ago where people really had access to medical information and a lot of it on the internet. Now it's like thousands of pages for every diagnosis. But when we first started getting decent medical information, you know, there was a joke you know, don't talk to Dr. Google, talk to me. But actually, I encourage people to have wearables. I encourage people to Google their diagnosis. The more educated a patient and their family are, the more involved they will be in their health care and the better the outcomes. Because I'm just going to say this, this is a total um, me and my soapbox. We have to start doing something different in health care than what we're doing now because we aren't doing a great job. I feel um, I'm reaching my 35th anniversary graduation from medical school in June. And I don't know that the population I'm taking care of now is healthier than what they were 35 years ago. And I think we need to do something different. So wearables, patient investment, information, something that we could share and understand together, I'm all for it. This is pretty small, but I'll just say this. Apple did a huge study back in 2019, New England Journal of Medicine lead article. They had uh, Apple Watch wearers volunteer. They tapped them through their uh, Apple user ID email if they'd be willing to be included. They got about a half, a, slightly under half a million people say yes. Only 3.5% were over 65. Understand that just the population that owns the watch, mostly younger folks, they were using it not necessarily for their health information. A lot of users use it for, um, you know, replying to texts or or whatever, you know, they weren't necessarily using it for AFib, but a pretty small amount were above 65. They had a small amount of people with detected atrial fib, but once the Apple Watch said AFib, they validated. They had them wear a patch monitor, an FDA-approved patch monitor. We use patch monitors all the time now, wearable monitors, and it confirmed AFib. The concordance was very high, so this was a study at Stanford and Apple, and it confirmed that the data we get from the Apple Watch is reliable, proven when tested against a usual medical source, and people can have it on their wrist all the time, not just when we put the monitor on. So um, that's one of them. The Alive Core Cardio Mobile has been investigated with multiple papers. If you look online and look at how many publications, again, this is owned, this whole thing was run by somebody who is a cardiologist, and this has validation where my opinion is probably I get clearer readings from this little less expensive device. And on the right is the six lead that it generates. Again, a six lead EKG from something slightly larger than a six stick of gum that I feel is accurate. Studies have shown when they uh, compare it against a 12 lead, the leads are accurate. That's something we have to believe and not say, well, we don't know that that's accurate. We do know that it's accurate. The studies have been done. The six lead one does cost more. You know, um, if you go to their website, they have tiers. I have a patient who I did an ablation on that owns a um, car dealership in northern Iowa, and he bought like the top of the line. He brings his cardia in to see me. It's in a suitcase. Like it came with like a metal briefcase. You do not need that one. I'm all for using the uh, entry level cheapy. I'm all for that. It works. I don't need six leads to determine. Uh, arrhythmia, SVT, AFib, VTAC, we just need the one lead actually, and we could do more investigation to follow. They're currently working, and when I was at this AI conference just a few weeks ago, he did a presentation where they're working on a three lead touch point. By the way, in order to get the six lead EKG, you do two fingers on one side, two on the other, and the third source to generate six leads, you put it on your thigh. So it's kind of like the, the RL or LL, it's either like a right leg or left leg um, 
lead when you think about putting on EKGs. So they're working on a viable 12 lead, which again, um, when we think of the number of patients, even um, we see hospital admin here, that we admit electively to begin drugs like sotalol or dofetilide. We're looking for QT changes. If I could have somebody at home with an accurate device that I could check their 12 lead at home and look at the QT, we wouldn't have to, if I can use this word, waste hospital beds for healthy people just to get an antirhythmic started. So there's huge uses to doing this. And also, when we have clinic patients come in the office, um, the nurses and the MA staff will tell you getting an EKG on everybody is cumbersome. People are removing clothes, putting all the patches on. So we love this data. Okay, the aura ring. So we have a little, um, I don't even know who that is, but that's some type of Instagram influencer. Um, this has become not only a great method for people to follow their sleep, their activity, and that readiness score. Nothing else will give you heart rate variability like this ring, but it also is a fashion statement. So if you were to look at Aura Ring online, there are people like um, Jennifer Aniston and I don't know, Prince Harry. I do think that the hands of the person wearing the ring in that picture are like Meghan Markle. So that there's a little bit of a um, celebrity appeal, but the ring is actually useful. It's much more expensive. So it's about the price of a watch, a little bit more than Apple's newest generation nine watch. But um, it's something that is, uh, I, again, I personally can't wear my watch when I sleep at night. To me, I'm just uncomfortable doing that. And this can give you a lot of data, especially people who struggle with sleep or struggle with insomnia. Um, not only does the ring give you data, and again, it has all those sensors, but it also, um, sorry. Oh will um, give you recommendations on how to change. So I just wanted to point out to everybody about a year ago, this was sold out online in I think less than two days, Gucci made an aura ring. It's $950. If you want one, they've sold out, but you could buy it on eBay for 2,500. I just checked the other day. So, um, but again, here is a wearable health device that has um, prominence in the style or fashion community, but that people are actually getting information on their health. I do not recommend that anybody buy this, but again, it's amazing, right, that something like this can be manufactured and sold out. It's all part of that um, kind of celebrity appeal. If celebrities can appeal to my patients and improve their health, I'm all for it. So CGM, so um, I don't see any of the endocrinologists here, but continuous glucose monitors. Yes, they're FDA approved, they're proven. There's two big brands, um, Abbott's Freestyle Libres on Generation 3. Um, for those who don't know, it is, uh, you place it on your skin. This is approved for uh, diabetics. You might see people out in the public wearing it, um, usually on the back of the arm. Um, one of the other competitor brands, you could put it anywhere, and it is a continuous glucose monitor. The newest generation of CGMs, you do not have to hold your phone up to it to get your blood sugar level. It will give you a continuous reading. For those of you who don't know, it measures glucose level in the interstitial fluid. It has a tiny little needle for insert. It's not in the bloodstream. This does not give you blood glucose level, but interstitial. For those who don't know it, I don't want to give you all the graphics, but it lags behind a little for the true blood glucose level. So if it reads 180, your blood sugar might be 190. It, there's that little bit of lag there because this is interstitial tissue that it measures. These can stay in place for a couple weeks, and um, now people are using them as a wearable to improve their health. As you know, we're currently at uh, almost 70% of the U.S. population is overweight or, or obese. There are all types of things out there to help people with this, and um, one of them is improving diet. You know, one of them is Ozempic. One of them is improving diet. It's certainly not a one-size-fits-all industry, but again, when I look at my career, 35 years, have I done something to improve this? Is it better and it's worse? And so those numbers compare, continue to rise for so many reasons, but mainly due to the food, the easy food availability in our current supermarkets. Um, but with the continuous glucose monitor, people are able to uh, often get this covered under their um, HSA, their uh, healthcare spending. And these can be used to help 
People know and realize when they're eating, when they're training, when they're working out, what their blood sugar is, and how they can modify what they eat in order to keep it from spiking. Uh, Blood sugar goes up, insulin goes up, insulin's a storage hormone, stores that blood sugar is fat, and people gain weight. So um, a lot of the websites, they will actually, they're nutritional websites, and if you have a um, healthcare spending account, they will help you fill out the paperwork to apply to use the uh, continuous glucose monitor for your healthcare spending account. Because again, the studies have shown if we monitor our blood glucose levels, even if we're not diabetics, that people can help adjust what they eat, how they work out to help with weight loss. Um, Some people, elite athletes, will use it for training as well. And that's not really what we're talking about here. So RPM. RPM is not rotations per minute, but remote patient monitoring. So remote patient monitoring, now the numbers there are even more staggering than the use of just wearables. Remote patient monitoring is probably, I think, again, going to be those that one big bridge that will help us help our patient population. So here's how it goes in 2024. Somebody sees Dr. Hallberg, maybe it's a patient who has um, four or five medical problems, maybe he likes to see this patient every three months, maybe every six months. If they're doing really well, maybe he just sees them yearly. But he sees them, their blood pressure is high, their blood sugar is high, their creatinine is a little bit higher, he makes medication recommendations, and then doesn't see them for three or six months. It's not a personal fault. He doesn't have time to see them more frequently. He really can't see them every day. But actually, every day, things are happening in their life, either with their diet, their medication, their medication availability, or other factors that are affecting their blood pressure, blood glucose, and their CKD. So remote patient monitoring comes in multiple forms. What I have put up here is a page from uh, an RPM platform that I like very much called Nudge, N-U-D-J, that has a whole platform that not only monitors patients' blood pressure, weight, smoking cessation, alcohol consumption, compliance with medication, but also social interactions. So many people in the United States um, have loneliness as their chief complaint. And so this nudge will nudge people to um, increase their social interactions, give them options in the community nearby. Now, RPMs aren't all this fancy, and this gives a lot of data. This is data that is sent to the provider on a weekly basis to monitor how things are going. Again, it's something that providers have to be willing to accept because it's More than just Dr. Hallberg's epic inbox, this is more information coming in. You know, so what do we do? Is this 140 over 80 blood pressure good? Does it need to be adjusted so it's more information? But I think it's those times between patient visits that we're really missing and helping getting our population healthy. You know, if you just see your doc once a year, twice a year, or maybe even four times a year, it's not enough. And how many patients do I see where they come in to see me and their blood pressure is high? I mean, really high. And I'll say, well, your blood pressure is really high. And they'll say, I've never had high blood pressure. And I'll say, well, when's the last time you had it checked? And they'll say, well, three years ago when I saw my primary doc. And you know, but this is not uncommon that people have huge gaps in between their touches where remote patient monitoring can bring it up to date. Now, we have other forms of remote patient monitoring. Um, In our practice for a heart failure patient, we use something called web care, which is for the congestive heart failure patients, a daily evaluation of weight, symptoms of shortness of breath, um, swelling in their feet, and a few other symptoms that they check off. And there's a notification that comes to our office if a certain percent of those are abnormal or yeses, or they need a phone call for either extra diuretic or whatever else needs to be done. So RPM doesn't need to be fancy like this, but the data from the nudge protocol, and they've collected hundreds of thousands around the country. Um, It has improved healthy eating, physical activity, uh, reduced risk factors, managed stress, less, excuse me, better sleep and social support. And again, we can't forget, especially in our senior population, that risk of, you know, quote, dying from loneliness. So we want to keep that. Um, So again, there's a lot of very specific ones. I know that um, in the large clinic group that I work with in Des Moines, they do have RPM for blood pressure, blood glucose, and um, 
weight check-in. So they can be anything. Again, you need that staff or you need a way to sort through all that data. So this is more data coming into the providers. And again, we'll be talking about AI soon. Um, by 2025, there is going to be expected 70.6 million remote patient monitor users in the United States. So that is jumping up 56% from 2022. Uh, these platforms are more available. Wearables, including uh, the Cardia, are more available. Um, wearable blood pressure cuffs, even just home blood pressure cuffs, people are collecting information. So it's not like we're going to have a choice. Should we utilize remote patient monitoring, yes or no? The answer is yes. And if it's 70.6 million people, that will include people in central Iowa and in Ames. We have a lot of heavily educated, smart patients who will be using this or wanting to use it. And it's just finding a, a creative way to integrate it into our um, daily uh, clinic and hospital-based practice. So uh, before I start talking about uh, AI, again, a lot of people call that artificial intelligence. Um, those of us more involved call it augmented intelligence. This is not to replace the human or be like some dystopian novels from the 1960s or 70s that like have computers running the world or chasing us down and killing us all or something like this. But here's the fact. In 1950, medical knowledge doubled every 50 years. So if you um, got your medical degree in 1950, you could plan to have your whole career where you didn't really have to, nor do they actually have strong rules that you had to do recertification of boards or anything. And you could really spend your whole career being an expert from most of what you learned in medical school and in your training program and be up to date and knowledgeable because not that much was changing. In 1980, medical knowledge doubled every seven years. So again, that's a pretty big change. 1980, every seven years, things are changing. Still, um, you know, you need to read, but you've got seven years to keep up on updated. And this is all comers of medical knowledge, not just cardiac or, you know, a specific area of internal medicine. This is all areas. In 2010, medical knowledge is now doubling every 3.5 years. And in 2025, it's expected to double every 72 days. And so the fact is, and it is, who, how can we keep up with that much medical knowledge? And, and you know, you, one human can't. And that's where I think augmented intelligence is really going to help us sort through the data, get us all as providers, nurses, physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, the data that we need and help keep us up to date. You know, you know, if you go online and read up to date, you know, it's just continuous. I mean, I try to keep up with cardiology and electrophysiology. I'm running a race, let alone, you know, one of my partners asked me, um, I'm doing or trying to do the L. KA for internal medicine, but like, I just can't do three areas, let alone if you're trying to keep up on all that's going on. So um, augmented intelligence, what is that? It is here. It's really here. And currently in the healthcare field, there currently are 17,000 startups in AI. There are people who are leaving um, education with uh, PhDs in machine and machine to machine learning. So again, this is not going to go away. I recommend we get um, up to date on it, be part of it, make sure guardrails are there to keep it good and healthy, patient centric, provider centric. Um, but we need to get on it because I cannot keep up with a doubling medical knowledge um, less than every year. So there's a few terms I'll use. I'm not pretending to be a um, AI specialist. I use terms that I've learned by reading and going to conferences, but I do not pretend to be one of these experts. I'm not even close to that level of intelligence. But large language models are deep learning models based on vast data. And again, um, as you know, something like chat GPT collects written word from 
all sources. And um, I'll talk to you about how big that has gotten. Generative AI is capable, capable of generating text, images, or other data. There's a new AI platform now that you could speak into it and it will generate videos. So the technology is there and it's roaring. And again, we have to think about how we could use that to make health care and what we do, including surgeries, procedures, better and safer for patients by harnessing this in a positive way. So chat GPT. Now, I mean, if people, not everyone said that they use it. Now, I'm not kidding. You need to use it. You need to use it at least a few times. There's a free online, it's like their lower level. They're on to like four now, but there's a lower entry level freebie. You could download the app on your phone and ask it a few questions. Um, it will write you poems. It will do an evaluation of um, any topic that you're maybe a specialist of. Dr. Halbert can ask them to stage CKD and what it takes to um, qualify for each level of CKD. It'll do it really wonderfully. So when um, this is a open platform and if everybody and anyone can use it and it continues to build on itself. So every time somebody asks it a question and maybe I ask it something, and it doesn't give me the answer I want. And I reply, no, you know, I didn't mean that. I meant this. And it'll generate another answer or essay or a poem. It writes poems, it writes haikus. But as you give it feedback, it's using that to learn and relearn. Um, as I said, as of a few weeks ago, 100 million users per week around the world. Every language, there are no, nobody's uh, limited. If you, if you haven't used it, you have to try it once or twice. The controversy is all the negativity around people using it in the workplace for their work, right? So there was an attorney on Wall Street that got fired because he had too many clients. So one client, he did their entire case through chat GPT, put in all the information. You could scan in information. They had the whole case laid out for him. He did it and he was fired for using it. But soon we will see it used for things like tax preparations, um, other, like, I'm just going to call them like menial tasks that can take the machines a lot shorter to do, but he was fired. Um, so the initial one came out with 117 million parameters. These parameters are often words or phrases or images. We're up to four coming. It will be a trillion parameters, okay? Current size is 300 billion words and growing. And if you all interact with it today and correct it or say something different that it hasn't heard, you'll be adding to the billions that are being added. Uh, for people who understand size, this 570 gigabyte, it's huge and growing. And so um, again, I, this isn't gonna go away. It's not illegal. Um, platforms are growing and we need to find a way to integrate it into our healthcare system in a healthy, positive way to improve patient care. And I've got some ideas. So AI and the EKG, this has been the big news. And in fact, um, interestingly, after I came back from the conference in Paul's Palm Springs with Mayo Clinic and AI, um, my parents called me the next day and saw that they saw on the news in Chicago that Mayo Clinic has a way of reading an EKG. Um, Mayo Clinic did an AI, a large learning model um, with something called um, CNN, which I'll talk about in a second, where uh, it fed in a couple hundred thousand EKGs and patient data points. And currently, the AI that they use is reported in Nature magazine. This is not, you know, a uh, non-peer-reviewed journal. They use the AI with all this data. You could go to Mayo Clinic. Everyone who goes to Mayo Clinic and gets an EKG has this done. It's automatic. Whether your doctor shares the information with you, that's up to them, but it's automatically done. They currently can accurately uh, give an ejection fraction based on the 12 lead EKG, uh, whether somebody's at risk for sudden cardiac death, the likelihood that they're going to have atrial fibrillation in six months, whether they have or do not have liver cirrhosis, and age, and gender. And some people say, well, you know, why would we need that? And how does it do it? Well, um, uh, I'll show you a slide. No one understands completely, but it's a 12, someone said, well, was it the QT interval? It's not the QT interval. It is able to see parameters by going through these convoluted neural networks that is able to see and um, things that the human eye doesn't. It still looks like an EKG to me, but it is able to determine all of these. Now, the age might not be right, but they're going to be giving your 
physical, uh, not biologic age, but the age you are based on your health status. So um, I'd like to get an EKG and see how old it gives me. But you may be given an age younger than your actual age or more concerning, older than your actual age. So it's called convolutional neural networks. They have really cool slides, but I'm not a, a specialist in that area, so I'm not going to pretend like I really can work with those. But they have 95 plus percent accuracy for this. So they, they, they use it, the terms they deliver in the papers is area under the curve. The accuracy is, is 95 plus for all of this. So it's not like voodoo, but nobody completely understands. Um, the first author for the paper, she is a PhD machine learning specialist. Her name is uh, Shishi. She presented at this conference and said, you know, they know how to put the data in, but when it goes between these neural networks, which is kind of like the neurons in the brain, nobody understands how all this information is given. But with the Eagle trial, Printed in, I believe, 2022 in Nature magazine, this is all validated. This is not magic box. So they give um, AI conferences. A lot of the work they've done at Mayo has been in cardiovascular medicine. And so the conference is yearly. Um, the, I went the first year was July of 2022. Probably total attendance was 30 people. And then this year, probably there was about 130. So I think more data, more interest, um, really interesting. New technologies. So AI and new technologies. We now have available a wearable echocardiogram. The, uh, it's a little bit bigger than a Band-Aid strip. It's a lot more expensive than one. But it is something that can be put directly on the patient. It is re reusable. And you could go to places where echo machines and electricity are not available and get information on a patient's cardiac status. So it is a new technology. And currently finishing up trials, um, it's hard to say exactly where this will be utilized. But again, um, in emergency situations, you need to know whether someone had a cardiac rupture out in the field. You paste a little uh, band like structure and you're able to get pretty excellent images. Here's a wearable blood pressure monitor. I mostly put it on that. It doesn't look like a blood pressure cuff, but it is. But this is um, on sale if you want to get one because the other watches soon will be having accurate blood pressure without a cuff going up and going down. So this really is tip of the iceberg. I mean, I gave you like a little look of what's going on. Number one, what? We need to have wearables. Um, uh, many of them in the cardiac arena have been validated. The studies are out there. This isn't a fly-by-night thing. Um, they help us diagnose patients. All of that information between the visits, remote patient monitoring is key. Um, again, I just have a feeling McFarland does. Now, you know, we do remote device monitoring. Patients with pacemakers, defibrillators, and loop recorders up at um, Mary Greeley Cardiology, they do have a device nurse, and that's remote patient monitoring. It's through their device, but they get information remotely. People have smartphone apps. It engages with that. We have a handshake every three months. They could send in information more frequently, and we pick up VTAC, AFib, and on these loop recorders, pauses. So that's one form. A lot of uh, hospitals upon discharge, and I don't know if um, Kira knows, you must possibly have an RPM for discharge follow-up to prevent hospital readmissions for heart failure, all those diagnoses that Medicare does not want to pay for, 90-day readmissions. So RPM, it's huge. I mean, it's not like, does this work? You don't need to get as pretty and fancy as nudge, even though I think I love the fact that they measure people's loneliness. But there is lower cost RPMs that have been proven to prevent hospital readmissions. We use this um, platform for our heart failure patients. And I think the people who have used it, now the patients have to use it. It's just like putting your Apple Watch on. You've got to take it off the charger and put it on. Otherwise, you're not getting info. Um, you've got to use a cardio mobile, put your fingers on it. Otherwise, we don't have the info. But people who use our, our web-based RPM for heart failure, we currently reached a year in our data collection. We had zero readmissions, 0%. That's huge. I mean, hospital, you know, hospital admin, they want to hear that. I mean, it, it's a loss for them.
Next, for electrophysiology, you know, as an electrophysiologist, here's my quick story. When I was in training, uh, electrophysiology was not recognized by the American Board of Internal Medicine as a subspecialty of cardiology until I complete the year I completed it, 1996 is the year ABIM recognized it. And fortunately, I trained at Emory and they did recognize that program. I think they recognized 14 programs that first year. When I did my EP studies at Crawford Long Hospital downtown in Atlanta, I got there early. I had to have four sharpened number four, uh, excuse me, number two pencils, not number four, that's Chet. GPT, um, number two pencils, and we had to fill a, a little container f in front of the reams of paper with ink because the EP studies were done on paper. We would generate about the size of a New York phone book paper, and I made all the measurements for the intervals on the arrhythmia detection with my hands, pencil, straight edge, and we did all the measurements manually for uh, the dysrhythmias. Currently, down the hall, in the cath lab, the room across the hall, we call the EP lab. I have technology in there in a screen where at any one time I have intracardiac echo images of all four chambers of the heart going. I just did a mitral papillary muscle VT ablation here on Tuesday. I have constant intracardiac echo, art line waveform, all the anesthesia machine waveforms, and I'm mapping with a grid catheter with over 64 electrograms, intracardiac electrograms generated as I'm mapping, along with multiple other catheters in the heart on a big screen that I could look at simultaneously while I'm doing the procedure, compared to when I put ink into an inkwell and then just killed many trees for that study, which we threw that paper away. You know, Everything now we save onto a cloud, so at the end of the AI uh, meeting, I met with some people who do EP at Mayo Clinic, and they're starting, they do have a company startup called Anamana. And what it is is a bunch of EPs interested in AI who want to do next generation things. And what they're doing is called um, your digital double. So before a complex ablation like the one I did here, this earlier this week, I would get all the information on this patient. They're EKGs echocardiogram, stress test, angiogram, if they had a cardiac CT, that, chest x-rays, labs, renal function, he had renal dysfunction, he was a type 2 diabetic, poorly controlled, obese, we get all that medication, excuse me, all that information, and put it into an AI program, and it would generate a digital double. It would be a digital view of that patient that I could do the EP study on, electronically and determine I ended up going transeptal with a puncture into the left ventricle to get this PVC ablated, but I could have gone retrograde aortic and found which way I'd be better to reach it. It wouldn't be the real patient. It would be an AI-generated patient. And then make sure that when we did the procedure, it would be the shortest time, the safest for the patient, and the best outcome. So I really think augmented intelligence is going to help us. Not only us, but our patients. And people can wish it away or think that um, it's kind of like, you know, Dr. Google, well, I wish they'd stop Googling hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. No, I tell my patients, yes, do. The thing I um, think that uh, we always have to be concerned about is we need to look at the data. We don't trust the machines entirely. Um, there's a group I just became a member of that any of you could become a member of called Chai. It's not T, although I love Chai T. It's um, a consortium of healthcare workers and AI. It started in um, Berkeley in California, but there you actually have to apply to be a member, even though they need people, believe me. But they're looking for members around the country to help be part of smaller groups to talk about technologies, where they fit, what is safe, and basically to keep those guardrails up. We're not handing, uh, we're not getting rid of physicians and medical schools and giving it to machines, but we're finding ways that this can make it better for our patients, improve the health of our population, get information to people, education. We still do poorly, no matter how long I spend in the room with my patients and make my staff give them educational material on the way out, we still do poorly with patient education, and this can be a platform that we could really teach people and get it to be interactive, get people interested. So if they, you know, see an aura ring on somebody and are struggling with their um, 
sleep or their readiness every morning, they can get some data. So um, I'm super excited about this topic. Um, I'm kind of late in my career type of person, but I just think um, this is where we need to look and we need to we need to all do something different to see the health of our general population improve. I really think using technology and using something to be the visit between the visit, that is just key. You know, no wonder people don't know their blood pressure is high or their blood sugars are exorbitant. There's not that visit between the visit. Um, use the CGMs. Uh, if you have somebody who's quote, pre-diabetic, see if you could get it uh, covered under their healthcare spending account. I mean, per a lot of these places, they can help you fill out the paperwork and at least to get someone started, it's a great thing to do. So, all right, I'm ready for questions, concerns, or concerns. You know, when it comes to AI, I think, you know, we talk about polarizing. It's like talking about politics. I'm not gonna talk about politics, but I think AI is close to that. Either you have people who think, that's crazy, you know, it's gonna be hell, or somebody, is that the name of that computer? Hell is gonna take over the world and we're gonna, you know, basically be made into slaves to a computer. That's not gonna happen. Or there's people who are super excited about it. And the right response is probably right in the middle, accepting it, learning how we could use it to benefit ourselves and our patients and keep it healthy and good for everybody. I think places like Chai and there's a few, you know, these groups are popping up all over. It's kind of like controlling, like after CRISPR technology came out to modify, modify genetics, you know, you want to make sure not everybody is getting their genetic code diced and spliced and people are choosing genders and whether someone's going to be tall, dark and handsome or short, and not so handsome. So we realize all of these things we need to be involved in. We still need the human element. Thank you for listening. And please, any questions? Yes. Just a comment on CGM. Yes. The newest CGM is Eversense, and it stays, it's an implantable uh, six months. Wonderful. And is that implant done in the office, may I ask you, or does it have to be in the hospital? And how big is the incision? So we implant ILRs, and it's really a small nick in the skin. It's much like an implanon or an explanon. With okay, those are small. But how about removing it? Six months later, come in, small incision, numbing, pull it out, put a new one in. And does this give interstitial glucose levels or true blood glucose? Is it still the interstitium that it gives you the... It is, and it's a little bit different technology, but it's fairly accurate. Yeah, yeah. So we've got our diabetic specialists, and so we love it. I mean, and do you find with your patients improved control if they know their numbers without having to poke their finger, et cetera, and so on? Yeah, she's saying yes. I mean, it's fabulous, right? It's fab. You know, like, I'm tempted to have one just to find out, like, what my blood sugar does do after certain meals. You know, it's just of interest. But again, I think you find this, uh, if your patients come in armed with information or with questions and you educate them, they're much more invested in their healthcare. It's just like normal. They're so used to coming to the doctor's office and being overwhelmed and not being able to understand us, hear us, or take that information that it's overwhelming. I mean, my big goal is to get a platform of education that's free on the internet and that people can really learn, interact with, ask questions. And again, um, you know, even when I think of, um, I'm going to talk about the low-hanging fruit of AI. This here's how AI can really help uh, Dr. Hallberg, myself, and other providers. AI in the room, recording our conversations with patients, making it into a, the visit note for the day without a scribe. And please, in Kansas City, they have this um, dragon has it um, being, you know, kind of platformed in a large Kansas City group practice currently. But Dragon sensors, uh, actually a camera and um, audio monitors are in the room. So uh, Dr. Hallberg talks to his patient, asks a bunch of questions, they talk, and at the end of it, he will say, I'm gonna order a basic metabolic profile and a follow-up on your echocardiogram in three months. It puts the orders in, he walks out of the room, no dictation needed, it's all done. He can see more patients, spend more time with each patient, and there's zero dictation. And this is a drag, but there's many products out there that are doing that. That's low-hanging fruit. Another low-hanging fruit would be taking this technology that's out there 
and finding a way to pull it in without using the nurses to get emails of patients' Apple Watch, then looking at them. This is, you know, Amanda will tell you, oh, this is artifact, this is artifact. Okay, this looks real. Sending it then to the doc, waiting for the doc to respond. But to have something to screen, sort, and help our staff. You know, it's not just the physicians that are being overwhelmed with inboxes and Epic and all this, but it's our staff as well. Oh, look, I... Change, at least you guys tried to make me feel good. You all will consider wearables, RPM, or AI now. But you're just trying to make me feel good. But thank you. Um, I like feeling good. But um, I think that there, there are people either online or here that are th actually thinking, no, you know, the computers are going to like, they're going to roll down the streets and like take over our world. They're not. But I, that's why I like to be involved. Like, I want to be on this chai committee and I want to be on a subcommittee and make sure that we're at least attempting to keep this all right. Because if you hand too much of it over to the scientists, and I uh, love the PhDs, but they don't totally get the nuances of healthcare and providers and all of that. So we want to keep really involved. Any other questions? Yes. Denise, um I go down to uh, Fort Sam Houston, Texas, and uh, do a little bit of teaching. Uh, I'm a retired doc. Yeah, uh, wonderful. Physician assistants, and I went over. They they don't have enough nurse. They don't have enough anesthesiologists in the military, so they're training a lot of CRNAs. Yeah. I went over to the CRNA building. They've got a sono transducer about the size of a pack of cards. Yeah, pocus. And if you're going to have a total hip, they'll take that transducer and they'll plug it into their cell phone and they're looking at the nerves around the acetabulum on the hip and they can do a periacetabular nerve block before your surgery. And after the surgery, these people are up walking around. It, the technology is, um, and, and that's that's minimal technology, but it, it's amazing. I never thought that could happen. Yes, I love it. And again, you know, I know this little area like cardiovascular medicine, other fields are using this major. Yes. Surgery, yes. And of course, here too, you know, we need more anesthesiologists. We need more anesthesia time. Absolutely. But ways to get patients in pain-free out, pain-free home sooner. Those are all things. And again, that's music to the hospital administrator's ears. You know, currently we have plans that are cutting coverage, cutting everything. And our goal is, and your goal too, if you're the patient, you want to be here as short as possible, but you want to leave as healthy as possible and not come back, not be readmitted. So I think that all of this technology will help us. But for those of you who don't, have um, anything I strongly recommend. Again, I'm not affiliated with anybody. For under $80 to have a mobile heart monitor that you can check your heart rate, pulse, or rhythm, it's amazing. Almost all the people, or all the people that Apple initially found in their Apple Watch study, they had no idea they were having AFib. AFib re remains the number one cause of cryptogenic stroke. And often the stroke is the first time we find it. And often they come with their embolic stroke and they're back in sinus rhythm. So we still don't know. And they still don't get a direct oral anticoagulant until they have their second stroke. And then maybe they see me. And then maybe I put an ILR in. And then we wait another few months to see their AFib. So like this wearable technology, you know, the, the cardia is something you can't wear. You would have to put it down and check. But a pulse check a few times a week. Even my post-ablation patients, I have them use it. My father had an AFib ablation. I have them check at least once a week. Um, this, is, uh, this is important information. Dr. Hallberg, will you consider using AI in your practice? Oh, awesome. He gave you just... <laughs> We didn't even practice that. But, you know, I think that, um, you know, the, the temptation is there like me, 35 years out of medical school, to say, oh my gosh, I'm not going to do it. That's horrible. I'm better than a computer. I want to talk to my patients. I'll still talk to them. But I'll just be able to do so much better with the use of technology. So um, thank you, Dr. Hallberg, for supporting that. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your day.